Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Janardan Ganeri and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about Buddhism with Rupert Gethin, who is Professor of Buddhist Studies at the University of Bristol. Hi, Rupert. Hello. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm very happy to uh, contribute. Let's go straight to the most philosophically challenging and counterintuitive contribution of Buddhism, which, for my money, is the no-self theory. In other words, we don't have any selves. I'm saying this is counterintuitive, but maybe how counterintuitive it is depends on what we mean by a self. Maybe you can start by saying what you thought they meant by the self when they were denying that we have selves, and why they were denying that we have selves. Okay. I mean, I think it seems pretty clear that uh, when Buddhism denies the, the, the self, it's a reaction, a response to a particular idea of the self as expounded in early Indian thought, especially the Upanishads, where you have this notion of the, the Atman. Um, and the Atman, it's a Sanskrit word that, that means self. It's the ordinary word for self in Sanskrit. But in the Upanishads, um, the word Atman or self is, gets to be used or understood in a, in, in, in a particular way. We are obviously at some level a flux or a, a set of different experiences, different feelings, uh, different thoughts. Um, so the Upanishads, to some extent, ask this question, you know, what underlies all these different thoughts, these different feelings we have? What ties all these t- things together? What is constant? And the answer is this self. Um, so the self is contrasted to the changing flux of experiences and feelings as that which is constant, that which doesn't change. So that's the the starting point um, of the Buddhist critique of uh, self. So in a sense, what Buddhism does is throw out a kind of challenge and say, well, yes, there are there is this changing flow of experiences, feelings, and so forth. Yes, they we we seem to be able to refer them back to some kind of constant, the self, that is the continuous, unchanging subject uh, of these experiences. But when we introspect, what we find is not the self, but rather a specific experience um, or feeling or so forth. Basically, um, Buddhism is, is, is challenging us to kind of identify or find this unchanging constant that underlies our experiences and is saying, well, where is that? I mean, in that respect, it's a kind of precursor into the kinds of things we find in, in, in David Hume uh, in the way he talks about the self, the kind of challenge he, he lays down about the self as well. The upshot of that then is that if the listener, for example, listening to this now, thinks about their own experience, what they'll find is that they are experiencing listening to your and my voice, but they're not experiencing some further thing, which is a subject who's listening to the voice. And actually, it strikes me that the Upanishads, to some extent, admit that because they often, or at least in some of the Upanishads, it's admitted that the self is a kind of hidden underlying subject, which is quite hard to access. And I think that if if I were the Upanishads, or if I were a Vedic thinker, and I wanted to reply to this, I would probably go after the Buddhist in two ways. The first way would be to focus on the identity or the self of the subject at a given time, and say, well, for example, I'm experiencing more than one thing right now, I might be listening to this podcast while running through a park, for example. So I'm seeing the trees, but I'm also hearing our voices. And then there's identity over time. For example, I want to be the same person who's listening to the end of the episode, who was listening to the beginning of the episode. So don't don't Buddhists have a difficulty 
explaining both the unity of experience at a given moment and also how it could be that one and the same person begins doing something and finishes doing that thing? Okay. I mean, first of all, I, I would say that Buddhists don't deny, don't deny that there is an experiencing subject. Um, I, that there is that kind of quality to experience that we have the sense of being a subject experiencing something. But what they would deny is that that, that um, experiencing subject is a kind of constant, it, it, it is a thing that is constant through, through time. It's rather a simple quality of experience. And the trouble is that when you abstract experience, that quality is, is a kind of nothing. Uh, that quality is, is part of the flow of experience, but it's not a thing. It, it needs the objects of experience to be there. Without that, it's a nothing. And so the challenge that the Buddhist, I think, would make to the Upanishadic thinkers is to say, well, you're just using this sense of subject, but you can't really tell us anything about it. You're imagining, you're projecting onto it that it's a constant, separate, independent thing uh, that, that is constant through time. But it's really just a particular quality, a particular aspect of what it is to experience, the sense of it. It's not a continuing thing in itself, because without a particular experience, it's, it's a kind of blank. Um, it has no content. If all we have then is particular experiences, aggregated, as they sometimes like to say, isn't there still a problem that we want to distinguish between one aggregate and another aggregate. There's the sensations and experiences you're having right now. So you're looking at my face, lucky you, and I'm looking at your face. And there's, and my seeing of your face, uh, is somehow together with my sensation of sitting in a chair, for example, whereas you're seeing my face is together with a different sensation of sitting in a different chair. How can the Buddhists explain that we have different, if not selves, then different aggregates of experience, either at a time or over time? Okay. Well, uh, they appeal basically to a theory of causality, of causal connection between phenomena. So basically what they want to say is that you and, and I are basically a collection of mental and physical, if you like, phenomena, we'll call them, mental and physical events, to use a more neutral term, that are occurring in a causally connected cluster. The word I, when I use the word I, I am referring to a particular, if you like, aggregate uh, collection, cluster pattern of mental and physical events that is arising and falling continuously from moment to moment, and so is in a constant state of flux. So it's the kind of causal connections. Th this pattern isn't random. It follows certain laws of um, causality. It's the causal connection between those events uh, that gives the appearance uh, when we experience things of, of, of a certain kind of unity. I guess one analogy might be that if you, I don't know, look at a color photograph in a, in a magazine, uh, superficially you look at the photograph and you see a picture of people standing in front of a scene with a mountain and so forth. But when you look at the picture closely, if you get out a magnifying glass, you see that, that uh, there is just a kind of well, it's just made up of dots of different colors. Uh, I mean, as I understand printing, it's, a, you know, you, they use just four colors and they get the whole range of things. But you see that it's just things, just these dots that come together and we project onto it when we look at it from a distance. We don't see the dots. We see a picture of people and mountains and so forth. And we are a bit like that. When we think of ourselves, uh, and others, we don't see these, this flux, this pattern of mental and physical 
events, we see people are kind of slot solid and constant. But that's not really what it's like, as it were, not really what is there. We've been talking about this no self theory as a Buddhist conception, and certainly there are plenty of Buddhists who taught the no self theory and talked in great detail about why it was correct. Uh, is this one of these cases where we say that the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist, like Marx was said not to be a Marxist? Did he actually teach the no self theory? Why do we think that this is something that should be associated with the Buddha in particular? Um, well, there is some kind of discussion about precisely what is said about the self in, in early Buddhist texts. That is, there is no place in the earliest Buddhist sources, such as the, the suttas of the Pali Canon, where the Buddha categorically says there is no self. What he characteristically is represented as saying is, this is not the self, this is not the self, this is not the self. So whatever you can point to, we can't take it as a self. Now, some people have suggested that this means that the earliest Buddhist tradition, even uh, maybe the Buddha himself, is leaving it open almost, whether there is a, a kind of self. For me, I think this is perhaps to to misunderstand what's going on here. I actually think this links into what is perhaps the greatest the, the, or the greater problem of the self for Buddhism. That is, Buddhism approaches the self in, in two ways. I mean, one is the kind of intellectual problem of the self, which is to some extent what we've been talking about uh, so far, i.e., you know, we can investigate through logic and reason this notion of the self and examine it. Does it make sense? But the bigger problem for Buddhism is that the self is perhaps bound up with, with attachment, if you like. That is, when you say, I have a self, or this is myself, you are, in effect, saying, trying to identify a part of the universe, <laughs> as it were, a part of the world, that you can say, this is mine, and mine only. And this is what I think is particularly problematic for early Buddhist thought. So that, it seems to me, is why there is this emphasis, emphasis on saying, this is not myself, this is not myself, this is not myself. Because there's no one bit of the universe that you can point to and say, you know, that's mine. I have control of that. It'll be mine forever and ever. And this is also, again, I think, a response to, to, to the kind of Upanishadic use of the word self. You might say that, you know, for example, I mean, there is a modern, <laughs> a contemporary school of Buddhism in, in, in Thailand, which says, well, actually, we can call nirvana the self in, in some kind of way. But, for mainstream Buddhism, there is almost a critique of the use of the word self, that to call something that it is impossible to kind of individuate and, and make personal uh, and call your own in some individual personal way, to call that self is a kind of, well, is stretching the meaning of the word self. Um, it, it's not normally how we use the word self. And so Buddhism wants to kind of deny that the, the word self can have any ultimate meaningful sort of referent, if you like, within the universe. Because you can't be selfish if you don't have a self. Well, that, 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 that is precisely it, yes. To have a self is inherently, in some sense, to be selfish. Mm -hmm. and, to, uh, and therefore, what, what, what the goal is to let go of self. And so sometimes in Buddhist discourses, you have to kind of let go of both um, self and not self, if you like. There's this kind of idea that if you get too attached to the notion that there is no self, 
it's a bit like you're still attached to, to self, as it were, by being attached because you're still preoccupied and caught up in the whole idea of do I have a self, do I not have a self? I think there's a passage in the Pali Canon where the Buddha is said to have remarked that uh, you can be attached to the idea of continuing to survive, but you can also be attached to the idea of being annihilated, which is maybe a slap at other ascetic um, traditions who are trying to achieve liberation in other ways. Yes, I mean that sort of idea that you you want to last forever, or the the, the idea that you want to blot yourself out, uh, it, it is both kind of pre uh, premised on this word uh, yeah. or, or this concept of a self attachment to the self. This seems uh, pretty clearly right that the no self theory has uh, crucially ethical implications. It strikes me, though, that there might be some unwanted ethical implications here, too, because one of the things that we tend to think is really important in ethics and morality is moral responsibility. If you do something bad to me, then I'm allowed to hold you responsible for it still tomorrow or a week from now or whatever. And so if we go back to this issue about continuity over time, what you said before is that there's a causal relationship between the so-called skandhas, or the, the experiences that constitute me right now, and the ones that will constitute me a week from now. And I'm wondering whether that's really enough to undergird a really robust notion of moral responsibility, because it seems like all you can really say is that me in scare quotes a week from now has some kind of relationship with me now but don't i need to be really genuinely the same agent the same subject of action if i'm to be held responsible a week from now or for that matter if i'm to be held responsible for what i do now in my next life when i'm reincarnated and of course the buddhists don't reject that notion um well yes i mean i think I mean, clearly Buddhism has a problem there, I suppose. I mean, as you were saying earlier, I mean, I, I, there are perhaps two ways of thinking about personal continuity. One is this kind of, I mean, you were using the, the, the idea of um, the kind of glue that, that, that holds people together, holds a person together. So one is one way of thinking about the glue is in terms of this constant underlying unchanging self that remains there. And the other is the causal connections that hold something together. I mean, so I guess uh, in, in, in sort of broad philosophical terms, there's a kind of substance theory of, of, of continuity versus a kind of causal process, a process view of, 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 of continuity. Now, Buddhism is committed to continuity, and it has to try and preserve some sense of continuity. The question is whether the causal connected connections are, are sufficient. I mean, at some level, uh, you might say all Buddhism can say is, well, yes, they are, <laughs> and try to, to art articulate in uh, detailed and sophisticated way the the way in which these causal connections work. I mean, one way. I mean, you were asking earlier about the, the way Buddhist philosophy sort of responds to these problems and develops. I mean, I guess in one way that Buddhism develops or, or, and responds to these things is to try and throw the challenge back back against its critics, because. I mean, there are critics from an early, early period. I mean, already in the Pali Canon, you've got people coming up and saying to the Buddha, you teach the destruction of the self, you're a nihilist. And the Buddha says, well, no, this is a misunderstanding of what I'm doing. So one of the things Buddhism does is to say, you know, to come up, you use this concept of the middle way between the two extremes of what you might say are annihilation and eternalism to which are sort of 
eternalism is a sort of word that is perhaps coined when we t talk about Buddhist texts and our Buddhist understanding of this particular um, concept. So, you know, one is extreme is that one person is the acts and the same person experiences the result, which is one way of explaining moral responsibility. The other extreme is one person acts, a different person experiences the result. Now, Buddhism claims that it avoids both these extremes and that it's the middle between those two extremes. And it explains its, this middle precisely by reference to the causal connections that hold things together. And traditionally, this is dependent origination, this concept of dependent origination, these links between these things. These are, this is meant to be the middle uh, way between these two extremes. By reference to that, there is the claim that you, you've avoided the extreme that says, uh, one person acts, a different person experiences the results. The causal continuity is enough to uh, answer the critic and say, well, actually, it is in some sense the same person experiencing the results. Just not in such a full-blown sense as the way yeah, yeah. shots want. Yeah. Something else you've worked on a lot so that I want to ask you about it is meditation. Yeah. And although that doesn't obviously seem to have anything to do with what we've been talking about, I was thinking that actually someone might wonder why a Buddhist would be interested in meditating because naively you might think that what you're doing when you're meditating is concentrating very closely on yourself. If you think about something like pay attention, paying attention to your breathing, for example, it looks like maybe what you're trying to do there is really get in touch with yourself. In fact, people even say, I'm going off to do meditation because I want to find myself, right? How, therefore, can the Buddhist be so interested in meditation while denying the self? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the starting point, I suppose, the, the, the Buddhist starting point, is the, the fact, if you like, of suffering, this word dukkha, the fact that somehow we try to become, be at peace in the world, we try to find... Um, some way of being comfortable in the world, uh, yet this is elusive. It eludes us in, in, in various ways. Something's wrong in the world, as it were. The, you know, what is, what is our problem? Well, the basic premise here is that our problems arise because we don't see the world as it is. We don't really see what's going on, what's happening. And we therefore seek ways of being happy, ways of being at ease in the world that are inappropriate, that do not fit with the way things actually work. So meditation is about, if you like, looking again at what's going on, uh, examining what's going on. This examining of what's going on, I think, refers back to the two aspects we were already mentioned about the, the theory of not-self. One is that this, we can criticize the notion of self from an intellectual and rational point of view. As even you know, modern psychologists will, will say, you know, we construct our own personal identities uh, and we're very uh, possessive of them. We feel threatened and, and, and so forth. So we become very emotionally attached to a particular notion of ourselves. So that even I, I can sit down and I can read a book on Buddhism on something about the, the, the Buddhist idea of no self. And to some extent, I might say, yeah, that makes some kind of sense. But, you know, I, I can then put the book down and then it, it straight away get involved in some kind of argument with someone. If someone criticizes the, the way I've done something or what I've said, I can feel threatened and undermined and so forth. So although I've just said, oh, yeah, I think this no self idea is, it makes a lot of sense, it hasn't really affected me or, or, or changed me in any deep way. So meditation is about actually looking inside and actually trying to, if you like, deconstruct ourself in a more emotional and kind of psychological way. And yes, that can look a little bit like, if you like, navel-gazing, uh, turning inward it is. But 
I suppose for Buddhism, it's a kind of necessary exercise because w from a Buddhist perspective, we spend not just, as it were, one lifetime building up uh, our notion of ourselves, our, our, our sense of self, but we build up this sort of sense of self and identity over many, many lifetimes. So if you want to kind of dismantle that, it requires some work, and meditation is an important part of that. And has meditation been important pretty much throughout the history of Buddhism to the from to the present day all the way back into the Pali Canon? Well, it obviously depends a little bit on what you define precisely as meditation. I would say contemplative techniques of various sorts have always played some role in, 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 Buddhist, in Buddhist practice, if you like. But it doesn't always mean that they involve, you know, sitting cross-legged, as it were, on the floor. I mean, meditative techniques are perhaps broader uh, uh, than that. It still seems, though, like a pretty striking difference between some of the philosophical traditions that we're familiar with in Europe, where, you know, you don't think of David Hume as meditating. No. Even, <laughs> even though he has some of the same points to make about the self yeah, as you were yeah, saying yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, as I understand, you know, David Hume sort of comes to similar conclusions and then sort of, as it were, shrugs his shoulder and say, well, we might as well. <laughs> Carry on living the way we uh, the way we do. That, that, that yes, I mean I think perhaps these meditative techniques. Uh, I mean they're not peculiar to Buddhism necessarily. I mean they're something that are are common to the Indian tradition in general, and and are, are where philosophy is connected with the idea that in many schools that. I mean, there is something you have to do and practice and develop um, in order to realize these ideas. Um, so, you know, basically, you're you're searching for this liberating knowledge uh, through which you can only ultimately you can get some sort of idea of what that might be like. But it's it, it's quite different from, from from realizing it. You need to do something to realize it. Yeah, there's a distance between understanding the arguments and actually living out the conclusions exactly. that yeah. they bring you to. Yeah. And meditation would be supposed to help, would be to bridge that gap yeah. in a way. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, within Buddhism, you have basically, I suppose, two aspects to meditation. I mean, traditionally, these are called kind of calm meditation and insight meditation. So the basic idea is that. You know, ordinarily, um, you know, as we go about our business in the world, our minds are a bit scattered. They're all over the place. You know, sometimes they're stiller uh, than others, but there's a lot of jumble and thoughts and they're a bit chaotic, our, our, our minds, in other words. And if you want to, as it were, you know, well, even common sense says, uh, tells us that, you know, when we're stirred up and distracted and not thinking clearly, we won't see the world properly. Um, you know, if you're, if, if you're worked up and upset, or, you know, a friend might say, well, you know, calm down, tomorrow things will look better, as it were. So Buddhism goes with that idea, if you like, and not just Buddhism, Indian theories of meditation in general, go, sort of run with that idea and say, well, if you want to see what's going on, if you want to see the world clearly, you need to settle the mind first. You need to stop all this distraction, this chaos going on and just kind of bring the mind into a settled, peaceful state. So this is calm meditation where you gradually still the mind. And the basic technique for that is to take a simple object and try to focus on that to the exclusion of other objects with the idea that the mind will gradually become calmer uh, and settle down. And as it becomes calm and settled, it becomes clearer, and this is often compared to kind of the impurities and, and mud stirred up in water. It gradually sinks to the bottom, and likewise, the mind, the impurities sort of temporarily settle and sink to the bottom, and the mind becomes clear, just like clear water. And once you have a mind that is clear, you can begin to examine what's going on, and this is where the uh, kind of – 
second type of meditation comes in, which is the kind of insight meditation, uh, where you look at very clearly everything. You examine, you know, your physical experiences, your emotional experiences, and so forth, and just try to see them for what they are. So this is insight meditation. And kind of mindfulness is a sort of link between both types of meditation traditionally, which is about, you know, um, a sort of clarity of mind, holding these, examining, looking at what's going on. There's, there, there's also some research, some discussion, which doesn't see so much light of day about, you know, sometimes the detrimental effects of, of, of meditation. Um, you know, there are various stories about people who walk off the street and do 10 day, uh, intensive meditation retreats who've never done any meditation before and sometimes uh, actually come out of those feeling worse than when they went in um, and sometimes having had quite traumatic experiences. What's interesting, I suppose, from, from about those, that in some ways, of course, is that is it, that is what you would expect because mindfulness or intensive meditation is precisely about um, deconstructing the self and deconstructing yourself, your sense of self, is bound to be challenging. <laughs> um, and this is why I guess within a traditional Buddhist framework, there is great emphasis on, on the, both on the kind of ethical framework and the religious framework. Uh, so in a traditional Buddhist color, in a traditional Buddhist culture, the, um, symbols of the Buddha, keeping the ethical precepts of the Buddha help to ground you, help to make you feel confident that you're going somewhere that is, desirable, going in a direction that is desirable. When you secularize mindfulness and strip away that sort of, if you like, support system, you might say it's not surprising that, that sometimes um, these things can be more traumatic and not just be as easy as they, they might be expected. Okay, well, on that sobering note, I'll thank Rupert Gethin very much for coming on the podcast to tell us about Buddhism. Oh, thank you. And I'll encourage you to join us next time when we'll be turning to the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, which contains the famous Bhagavad Gita, a real high point of antique Indian philosophy. That's next time here on The History of Philosophy in India. <laughs>